I'm Jesse Brandenburg. I'm a principal engineer I'm in, in software. My, my expertise is Linux device drivers and performance stuff. Um, I've worked a bunch on helping get this product ready for market. We've, uh, we had to work over many years um, to get all the pieces in play in order for ADQ to be ready to uh, be deployed. So some of the things that we use as baseline technologies for this is uh, BusyPull sockets. Um, which we introduced to the kernel back in uh, kernel 4.12, which is quite a while ago now. Uh, we are uh, using that to help accelerate the application's access to the data in the queues without having to wait for interrupts, um, helping bypass scheduling delays, things like that. So this helps us um, get better predictability, as Brian mentioned, and uh, reduce latency and jitter uh, from, from the application's perspective as it's reading data from the network. So when you deliver, like Brian talked about, with the, the queues to um, a dedicated queue set, you now have the application able to pull data out of those queues in an immediate fashion. So um, really, another thing we added was this um, this socket office for the NAPI ID, right, is, is providing this hint that gives the, ap the application a way to specify to the, the queues, hey, this is my data, um, and this is what I'm interested in as it's coming back up the stack. So, the, you know, we're steering traffic in um, using TC, the traffic classifier layer in the kernel. So we've extended the MQPrio um, shaper to to add capability for doing hardware offload. So our devices are using those hardware offloads. So these are all the ingredients that you add together to, to, to make ADQ work. Um, so between those changes in, in this first set of kernel enhancements, and I have a couple more on the next slide, the, the, the affinitization of an application to a set of queues, um, and you add the, the polling, and you add, um, I'll talk about in a little bit, the, some of the other performance features together, and you really start getting this kind of integration. And when you add all these things together, many of them are already available, like talking about how old these kernels are, 4.12 and 4.15. They've been around for a while, but it was hard to use all of them together. So what we're providing here with ADQ is often, uh, I think of it as being the best, as being an integrated set of things, an integration, right? We're providing the integration to the end user in a way that's consumable. So they can uh, you know, configure their application to get a benefit from this particular setup using our hardware to help provide offloads that really assist the application. So for the for the steering of the traffic or the I guess the classification function mm -hmm. um, is that just based on purely sockets or um, is do you have some ability to look at things like maybe the applications is set, setting like diff serve code points or something along those lines or some other parameter in the packet H how are you actually matching and determining that uh, this packet is coming into the net and we need to associate it with a so, certain queue. Yeah, everything for right now is socket based um, from, from what we're doing, right? So we use the sockets to help define the, the flow, right? The flow ID, and that becomes this flow identifier. And, and this, the hardware actually, when it's finding, remember we look back in the parser and how it's uh, developing the field vector. When it ma matches something, it actually tags the packet with an identifier. And that identifier goes to the driver and the driver can pass that up the stack. Um, to make sure that the, what the hardware recognizes be able to be looked up, right? The, um, like Brian talked about, the flexibility of our parser allows you to add um, things to match on, right? So maybe that gives you more of the, the realm of what you're asking about. Like if we wanted mm -hmm. to add the capability to look at a particular field in the packet, you can do that. Um, but it's not necessarily built in ex uh, directly from the parts that we have okay. now. And I assume, You've got multiple NIC cards in the 800 series, right? Um, do they all function the same with regards to ADQ or yes. are, okay. Is there maybe different amounts of buffer memory per, uh, for different uh, NICs in that series? Like, you know, so that you can carve that out and allocate it as needed? So the, the chip's the same chip. Then the different configurations that you saw as the cards were floating around the tables, right? We have a four by 25 and a two by 100. The, the chip's the same chip. Um, the resources in the chip are divided differently depending on how it's configured, right? So um, you may have, uh, 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 it's a fixed number of queues per chip. So if you have four ports, there's less total available queues for each port. 
So I, um, same thing goes with a lot of the other resources, including the filter um, lists or the tables of filters. They're sized by the chip limits, and so there's a single limit for the whole chip, and we divide those per port, um, it, usually in a pre-configured way, although sometimes it's best effort, we can like trade you know, resources between the, the ports. So um, for the most part, it's, it's mostly static uh, ahead, set ahead of time based on the configuration of the board. So to continue just real quick on that, the, sure. the ADQ, and just make sure I didn't miss a, a segue in there. Earlier okay. on, you were talking about being able to match on MAC address, VXLAN information, um, the S tag, C tag kind of things in mm -hmm. there. So that tells me that you're at least looking at either all of the bits within X number of bits in the header coming in or something else. Mm -hmm. It would seem, and, and I know not necessarily going as far as looking to the data field like you, you had talked about, but the, the DSCP seems to be kind of a, a common yeah. thing that people would be interested the, in the, just because of how many other queuing options that we do with it. Is, is that something that would be open to user programmability if it's not going to be built into code to begin with and in the, the rule sets that you had matching, you know, start on bit X and go to bit X because it'll be in this position and, mm -hmm. you know, does it match this value or, or what kind of... So the parser is, um, is programmable and it's reasonably smart in that it can figure out how long the previous segment was in order to start looking at the beginning of the next thing, right, that follows. So it's, we're not doing like a U32 based thing like in the classifier for TC where you're telling it a byte offset and a length of that field to look at. Um, although when you're programming the parser itself, that's exactly what you have to do um, yeah. up in front. But when the parser is running, um, it can it can look at varying length uh, fields to to you know like handling different header lengths and things like that to try and figure out where the next header thing is. Um, so yes, I, I think to answer your question. Yeah, yeah. So one one of the the first phases of of introducing this, and as Jesse said, you know, we've been working on enabling this over multiple years. We're using um, you know TC Flower for the configuring the rule set. It has limitations of so what it can do is pretty much what we can do at this point. Um, you know, so uh, there are a couple features that they have that we haven't implemented quite yet. But um, you know, so if they can't do it. We're looking at you know continuing to uh, build the build the capabilities through the, through the community work. So yeah, part of this is the classifier configuration interfaces. You have to have the stuff available in software first, so that we can then offload it in hardware. So we we have uh, you know it's a multi-step stairway to get <laughs> to get all the way to the end. But yes, I think that we could conceivably you know enable any field you wish um, in the packet within the first. Uh, I don't remember how many. I think we look at the first 256 bytes of the packet, right? Okay. Well, it, I mean, I, I looked at this four. and, and the, the first There's application, there, yeah. at, especially at those speeds that I think of, is service provider. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and typical service provider, at least, again, based on today's stuff, right. is, it has been really DSCP is the, the primary. Yeah, I mean, I would say... Things. Probably to dovetail on that, I mean, the three most common use cases for like the typical network engineer, if we want to make this seamless and bring what we're all familiar with in the, the you know, the, the backbone and all that stuff and bring that into these NICs, like it would be either your 802.1p bits in the Ethernet header or in the IP header it would be your uh, your IP TAS or your diff serve code points, which is right. a little bit of an overlap right, right there. Right. But, um, you know, that would be pretty straightforward to do. Yeah, I think most of that's classification covered. on um, those. But yeah, it, th that's the whole idea behind the yep. flexible parser, right? Is yep. just to be able to define what you want and get something running in that case. So in that vein, because um, I do a lot of work in the service provider space, and QoE is a big thing, being able to identify applications, traffic, queuing with FQ Coddle and things like that. Is are you seeing application applications like this going into like QoE engines? Because that's something that the big carriers are always developing to get past you know, DSCP and 802.1p to be able to look yeah. at layer seven. So, um, and I forgot to mention the primary, well, I'll, I'll mention it here after, um, in a minute, but I'll mention it now. Um, the primary focus here, cloud, you know, are cloud applications right now, database, web, so the tiered applications, not necessarily comms, because DP, that's really where DPDK comes in. This is a kernel enabled um, and using the kernel-enabled driver, gotcha. 
right? Yeah. So the kernel driver, the full stack. Mm -hmm. So this is a way of accelerating the kernel uh, and the, the networking stack there, whereas with DPDK, yes, we can do all this. You know, so what you see in, in the, in that are, uh, you know, that's in the field vector, we can actually modify our input set, we can modify things, and that, and I'll talk about this um, when I talk about DDP, or the D dynamic device personalization section. That is really where we're, we're um, looking to do this with DPDK, um, because that's where those, those applications are, are primarily focused. So we'll, there, it's a blended thing where we're, you know, kind of, you'll see the stuff merging together because we're looking at how do we take advantage of some of this with DPDK. Well, we already do polling. That's, you know, the, the first thing that DPDK brought. And so there's, there's some of this that's already kind of done in, in the DPDK user space world where we're going to um, enable it through the kernel on this side and then everything will kind of meet in the middle eventually. So, of, of course, the other piece that Brian talked about is we are enabling that egress shaping, the transmit shaping through the, the TC setups um, and, and doing the rate controls and stuff like that. So that was kind of the last piece of this slide. Um, so how granular can you get with that? Because I know, you know, in working in the QoE space, you know, we'll say things like in this aggregation network for this provider, you know, I want these, this tier of, of customer to be able to get, you know, this much streaming media and this much access to Microsoft updates. And you'll write these very, very complex queuing algorithms. You know, how, does, how much of that can be pushed down to the NIC level? Because a lot of that's being done in software right now. We can do it through T, what TC can handle. Okay. So, you know, we can, we can do a rate limit, uh, a transmit rate limit and a uh, minimum um, for the for the set of TCs or queues, uh, the queue sets. Okay. So basically you set up the set of queues, which is a, for a TC, that's what these. Okay, so you can shape on ingress and egress with that? Ingress, not, is, you, not so much. It's, it's harder because yeah. you can't really control that's, how much traffic we, is We work with the, right. the switch, switch does right. that because that's their transmit, right? Okay. And then, but we, we can essentially do it by limiting the amount of resources associated with the receive. So if you only want two receive queues, whatever two receive queues can do, that's you know kind of a you're going to drop the packets or pause them, whatever the the case may be. Um, you know you give them 16 queues, 32 queues, you get more resources. So there are ways of, of playing with that um, and associating you know the core speed for those queues. You can slow things down, speed things up by adjusting core speed um, through software. That gets your question? Yeah, it did. I'm just yeah. curious. You know, it's, it's just very, you know, the QE work we're doing right now is very CPU intensive, and I know they're always looking for ways to offload that down into the NICs. So I was just curious what, what you could do with the newest generation of NICs. Right, yeah, like Brian said, we're limited by configurability right now. Um, right. So we'll be extending that over time, right? We're working our way to our first software release for this card, and we'll be adding a lot of features as time goes on. <laughs> Cool. And working with the kernel. <laughs> and working with the kernel to add more features to the kernel. So the, the, the other parts that, like Brian had talked about, the way that we implemented them is uh, the, the identifier, like I already mentioned, the, the rate control we talked about a little bit. Um, symmetric queuing we added to the, to the kernel here in more recently. Um, and what this allows for us to do is to take all these, like I said, take all these things and add them all together. And you end up with this really nice, like we talked about the colors in the graph before, the lanes you know, from an application running um, and multiple applications, they all get their own set of queues. You're polling, so you're avoiding interrupts and reducing latency. Um, the, the, the hardware is doing steering to those queues. Um, we're also, trying to implement things uh, to, to use the, the, the BPF and XDP programs to try and help uh, um, filter and add extra capability over time in this space. So the, between all these things together, this is what we're really talking about when we say ADQ, right, is the better together model. So we will uh, have, uh, in, coming right up here is Paul, I think, who's gonna talk about developing one of these applications um, and what ADQ did for them uh, in order to help them improve the performance of their database app.